Hey, Dirt Farmer Jay here from DirtFarmerJay.com. We love having a circular saw like this in our shop to cut down sheet goods. And whether you're using a cordless model or a corded type, these are really handy saws. But if you really wanted to work harder for you and to get great, straight, crisp, square edges, then you need a saw guide. I'm gonna walk you through in this episode how to make this saw guide, the kind of different uh, materials that you can use and what the difference is between the saw guide and the saw track. Stay tuned and I'll tell you all about it. Hey, Dirt Farmer Jay here from DirtFarmerJay.com. Well, we love having this saw and we've really gotten it to the next level by creating this saw guide. And I'm gonna show you the different materials that you can use to construct it. In this case, we simply use some clear pine uh, that was really stable and straight and beautiful. And we used tempered masonite, was the actual brand masonite. And tempered is really smooth and hard on the other side and beside it smells good when you cut it. Uh, it's not the untempered side or type, which is kind of fuzzy and soft. This is pretty dimensionally stable. So I use that. This is about a 3 16 a little bit thicker than that, for the base on the saw guy. You could also use uh, these types of plywoods where you've got uh, solid core plies in here and there's a lot of plies. These are Baltic birch type of plywoods. Very dimensionally stable, a little bit thicker, but very smooth. So whatever you've got on hand, and I even know of a gentleman that built one of these using plastic on the bottom, a really nice thick plastic for dimensional stability and, and being able to mill it. Now, before we get any further, I wanted to give credit where credit is due. I initially got the idea uh, from this from the One Minute Workbench, and I put a link down in the description below if you want to check out his video at his channel. Feel free to do so. He's a great creator, and he certainly inspired my thinking. And I came up with a couple other little enhancements or things that I wanted for my uh, my template or for my guide. So we'll go through these. So I'm going to take you step by step. But before we do, though, I'm going to ask you a favor really quickly. If after you watch this, you find this video to be helpful, won't you like it? And better yet, won't you subscribe to our channel? And when you do, ring the bell, because then you'll get notified approximately every Friday of another great video episode in the home, the garden, vehicle care, uh, being a great homeowner, uh, Maggie's Kitchen, and great heritage cooking. Well, you'll just learn how to just do it yourself. And while you're at it, check out our great new website at DirtFarmerJ.com where our new merchandise line is coming on. There's a great there, Maggie's blog. Uh, there's all sorts of stories that are out of the kitchen and great recipes and resources you can download. And it's a great place to interact with us. Well, let's get to it. Let's build this guide. So let's look at the basic materials you need. So I just started out with a piece of masonite as I showed you and some one by two clear pieces that were straight and ready to go to work for us. Uh, the dimension of the masonite was about 40 inches long. And I found out later on that gave me the cutting width that I needed for common size of cuts here that I do in the shop. More about that in a little bit. Now, so after you've got your straight stock and you've got your masonite, the first thing to do is to glue on and affix one of the edges along the factory edge. And I checked that edge to make sure it was true. Just because it came to the factory doesn't mean it always is, but in this case it was. And so I was able to use the straight edge and the good old finger pad to fill the difference to make sure it was absolutely straight along that edge. And I put down a generous bead of glue, clamped it on, flipped it over and used my pin nailer to make sure it wasn't gonna slide around until that glue set. And so that was the first thing that we did. So now came time to do a little bit of dry fitting of the second guide. And to do that, you use the base of the saw itself right there to determine the width there. So I placed the saw uh, against the glued on edge that I've already done and I dry fit the other one on the other side to give the approximate dimension. Before we go forward, I just want you to see real quickly what saw blade that I'm using there. It's a six and a half inch 60 tooth blade that is designed specifically for melamines, which we're actually gonna be doing in this project, but it also uh, allows just much smoother cuts on plywood and that sort of thing. More teeth in the work and out, coming out of the work and little distance sharper, uh, teeth really make a difference on uh, reducing splintering. So that's the blade of choice for me. You can also get that blade in 40 tooth. It'll work reasonably well. It's only a few bucks more. Get the 60 tooth. 
Now, when um, when I started to put this together, just out of curiosity, I wanted to know what the width of cut was going to be, how long I could get uh, of, of the saw into the work. And so I went ahead and put it in the end blocks in uh, against the glued in piece, Again, dry fit them, and then I put the saw down and lowered the teeth down till it was touching the surface of the base. And I put literally a Sharpie marker there just as a temporary marker to show where the start of the cut was and then the end of the cut and then measured the distance. And what I found is that this guide was going to produce roughly 24 to 26 inches of cut. It turned out afterwards that it was closer to 26, which is perfect for all the 24 inch wide stock that I cut. This in the background you can see right here is all 16 inch, but there's a lot of 24 inch in this that we're working as well. And you don't want to be in the middle of cut repositioning. Another great thing you can do with all this is make different lengths. I plan to make another one later that's about 54 inches long so I can cut 48 inch wide uh, sheets. And if I get it down to that size, I can probably run it through the table saw so I don't need an eight foot plus straight edge. At least now, you may, uh, but you can use the same basic construction and scale it up and down. After I determine the uh, width of the uh, of the capacity, or let's put this, the length that I could cut through the jig now, it was time to go ahead and uh, getting close to put in the second guide rail, the one to the right that would ride along under the motor side of the saw. And what I did there is butt up the edge of the base against the left guide. And then I used a couple playing cards uh, on each, the front leading edge and the trailing edge of the guide on the opposite side to create a little bit of wiggle room so that the saw would slide through there. And uh, at first all seemed really well, things were going well and I slid it back and forth a couple times. And then I started getting some little jams here and there. I looked for straight, had a little slight warp uh, you'll see in a subsequent picture a clamp that's kind of going sideways, and that was to help address that with slight pressure. But here's what I really found out. The edge of the guide, these are construction saws. They're not fine uh, trim saws like a true track saw, like from Festool or something like that, which are high precision tools. These are for in the field and the construction trades, and so they're not going to be super fine tuned. And so what I needed to do was find out where I had some lumpiness, and you can see where I put a uh, straight edge along the edge and you can see the slight gappiness that's along one end the closest to us in the picture. Uh, and so what I did is actually because it's a soft metal, I can actually run it along my stationary belt sander and I trued up that edge. It took several passes, a little uh, trial uh, fits back and forth. And then you can see here when I put the straight edge on again, we had a beautiful true edge and that solved the problem. Now we went ahead and dropped it back in in the guide, put the uh, the cards in around it. And here, I'm just gonna show you kind of a swing around shot so you can see the front and back leading edge and trailing edge of the base with those spacers and how that was all done. And once those spacers were in place, and I did one more run up and down to make sure it all worked. Then we went ahead and glued that in place, pinned it. Once the guide was freed uh, from all the excess material, I went ahead and laid out on the back those reinforcing screws and did a nice pattern. Why not do them in a nice setup? Do a little bit of craftsmanship there so you enjoy it every time you pick it up. And we laid out in a nice repeat pattern around there, took it to the drill press with the appropriate size countersink bit and went ahead and drilled those in. Uh, then I just took the opportunity to use a sanding block to knock off all the edges, make it easy on the hand and to soften the edges so they're more durable and got that all done. Then went ahead and drove all the screws slightly below the surface. And that's the reason we countersunk them the way we did. But I made sure that there were no screws standing proud and we got all that in place. The next thing you can do is to run a very slight score cut that just helps you to position where you wanna drill the sight holes. If you're using a Forstner bit, you don't really need to do this because Forstner bits are also guided not just by the center point, but by the rim of the drill bit. But I like to have both uh, ways to do it. So I went ahead and uh, just set this saw just slightly below the surface of the base, put it into the guide and ran it along there. And you can see the resulting line that's just barely cut along the surface. It becomes a layout line. And to highlight a little bit more, I just took a metallic Sharpie pen, a silver or gold one, 
laid it in the line to make it stand out. Now at this point, I went and took it over to the drill press and using a one inch Forstner bit, uh, just laid out a line. I didn't center them directly on the line. They were off center a bit. That's just preference. If you want it just perfect down the center, do that. But went ahead and drilled out each one of those after I laid out a nice pattern. So there are five holes, one on each end, equidistant in, split to the middle. Again, that's preference, just uh, so when you pick up the tool, it looks cool. Uh, but I got those five sight holes done, and now the jig is ready to use. Here we go. All right, let's get to work here and show you how we put this uh, this fixture or this uh, guide to work. Uh, there's one important thing to know about, in case you didn't know this, about the circular saw, how they cut. Uh, when they're called a circular saw, it's because they're not a reciprocating straight up and down. The path of the, the uh, teeth is in a circular motion, hence the name. But that brings up an important point here. When this saw is running, it's turning in that direction. What that means is on the trailing edge back here, where the kerf has already occurred, where it's already been cut, the teeth are encountering or going by the work in a downward fashion. However, on the leading edge, as you're going forward in the work here, that means that the saw is cutting from the underneath and coming up through the work. That means it's prone to chip out right there. So one of the tricks that many uh, carpenters do when they're doing finish work is number one, use as high a tooth count as you can. Number two is to put the good side of the material down because it won't chip out uh, as it's coming up through it. The back side of the material would chip out or would be more prone to it. And there's ways to fight that, cutting through tape, scoring the line and all that. Be that as may, in this case, what we're cutting here is a melamine board. There is no bad side. Both edges or both faces are going to be showing. So what you have to do is be very careful about cutting them. So the first thing that we do when we run this through the guide is I have lowered the blade just deep enough um, that it will score the surface of the, the material without going all the way through and minimize chip out. And then we'll take a second cut through at full depth. Now, one other thing you got to see really quickly here is around the side here. Whenever you're doing this material, I love stacking material on material so you're not handling it multiple times, but you've got to use riser blocks to raise all this off so that when your blade is below the work here, that you're not scoring the faces of all this and everything's clear. It also gives you clamping room that you need to clamp on the guide. All right, well, let's go ahead and, and make this cut here. This particular layout, I need a six foot piece. Uh, and this will be the third one of these we're cutting, uh, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do a, a layout. I always do two layouts, even though I'm going to be using a square. And if you really wanna do uh, go overboard and really get it accurate, do what's called the three witnesses type of approach, and that is lay it out three times. And then what we're gonna do, so I have three uh, 72 inch marks from the left end. Now I'm gonna throw on my square and I'm gonna bring that right up there. And you know, if those three witnesses line up, I got it. So you can see right there, look at there. One, two, three. So let's go ahead, keep that pencil nice and vertical and sharp. Let's lay out that line. We now have our line to cut. Now we're going to go ahead and put on our guide. Now, a couple of things I did on this guide real quick. I also should write this, no clamp. Uh, you don't use the clamps on this side because that's the side that the saw motor is. And when you go to clamp or to run it through, if you've clamped it there, you're going to collide with this. Uh, don't ask me how I know that. But anyway, uh, you're gonna go ahead and uh, clamp only on this edge. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna line up our, our guide and I'm gonna have you look straight down if you can. That's a little bit of a weird angle or down the guide until you can see it. And we're just gonna line up those lines using those holes to tell where the line's gonna be here. And if you can, in this case, I'm actually gonna back this up till I've got three line showing again and i've got one in the middle one there one down at the bottom look at that they're all lined up 
Then we'll go ahead and slip a clamp on it, clamp it down nice and tight. And when you do, uh, you know, depending on what the material is, you may have to put a pad on or a piece of paper. This is pretty durable. I'm putting moderate pressure uh, to stop it from sliding. Do another check. Let's go ahead and throw another clamp on it here. And there we are ready to go. One final, it is a beauty. All right, let's go ahead and we're gonna do our scoring cut. So how we do, will you take a look for yourself here and see what we've got here? That is, I'm gonna put it together. Look how clean that is. It's pretty doggone close. And if I pull this apart, chip out is really minimal and it's interesting. It's more on the waist side than over here. This is a good cut for the amount of investment the investment to build this tool is around $20, $25. Now that brings up another point really quickly. What's the difference between a guide and a true track saw? Well, you're looking at two different things that have similar functions. Both are designed to put straight edges onto either uh, sheet goods or to take something down to size. But in the case of track saws, a lot of times those are actually uh, used to edge rough lumber, especially hardwoods and that sort of thing. So they're more precision. The track saw though, the big difference is, is the interlocking base that rides along in the track that doesn't allow it to lift, to rotate, to do all sorts of distortions. It's very precise. And so this depends uh, on this guide here, that depends on you keeping the saw down on the track. And if you were using a single-sided guide, which many people have done, I did many years, as a trim carpenter building out cabinets and uh, all sorts of things like closets, we would use a single edge guide, but that depended heavily on you paying attention and keeping that saw to the left as you cut. Well, the track saw takes care of all that, but the price point is significantly higher. Now, in the meantime, you can build these kinds of guides. They're not an absolute replacement for, but they're somewhat a substitute that will get your work a lot closer. They're kind of an entry level. You'll see whether your work and the method, the way you work, really lines up using these kind of devices. And perhaps down the line, track saw is a wise investment for you. And there's some moderate uh, level ones like from Craig Tools. There's a high end ones from Fest Tools and other that are coming on the market right now. If you have a device like this or some insights you'd like to offer to your fellow readers or back to us, then feel free to do so in the comments below or over on our website at dirtfarmerj.com. If you found this video to be helpful, won't you like it? And better yet, subscribe to our channel. And when you do, ring the bell so you'll be notified approximately every Friday of great video content about things in the shop, being a great homeowner, we can just do it yourself, taking care of appliances and all sort of home repairs and some great heritage cooking over at Maggie's Kitchen, great blog content and recipes over in her section on dirtfarmerj.com. Until the next time, I've got some cutting to do. We'll see you soon.